We still do seven NUFC Matters show a week for free. But if you want to help support NUFC Matters, then there are a few ways of doing it. Hit the like button on each live broadcast and video. This helps the channel grow. Hit the subscribe button and select the all notifications bell so you don't miss a single show. If you want to help us financially, then you can join the channel using this button with the membership starting at $1.99 a month. Or you can drop us a donation in the chat using a super sticker. We're also looking for sponsors. If you'd like your brand advertised on the flies for the show and featured during the ad break, then email john at nufcmatters.com to arrange today. Good afternoon. Welcome to NUFC Matters with me, Steve Ray. That is talking to tune with Sid from Songs from the Attic, 1977. How are you, Sid? Very good, mate. How's yourself? Very good, mate. Very good. Uh, but only the football spoils it. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> well, enhances it as it had been the previous week when we won against Wolves. But um, we were hoping we'd turn the corner. Um, I mentioned this the other night uh, on the professionals, and um, and I also mentioned it on uh, on the fans forum as well. You know that Biffa on NUFC.com, I think nailed it when he said, "I thought we'd turned a corner, but in fact we'd gone into a cul-de-sac, which was Stamford Bridge." And, yeah. and and I mean, it's it's been a stop-start season for Newcastle. Um, you know, affected by injuries. Etc. And I guess if there's a game that epitomises everything that's been right and everything that's been wrong with Newcastle's season, that that probably was the game. Two wonderful strikes, two great goals Cracking in a place goals. where in a place where we struggle to get goals. Usually, we struggle to get anything down there. Um, you know, yet you know Newcastle concede three against a team really that I think we all felt we could have beaten. Well, I went in there and I genuinely thought for the first time in years, I thought we would comfortably win. Not just win, but comfortably win. And I'm, I'm talking two, three. I, I, after last week's performance, I thought we would just go in there, do ex exactly the same as we did. Just do that sort of low block, defensive block, and then hit them on the break because we've got proper pace going up front. And I thought that's, that would be the best way to pick them off. Um, and we went front foot. And for the first five minutes, look looked great. And I'm thinking, OK, this is not what I was expecting. Uh, didn't expect any of that at all. I thought Howard resolved any of the issues last week against Wolves. And I thought, you know, excellent. We're going to go back to the old style about from a season and a half ago and see the season out. Then go and get some new players and then change the, you know, have players who can play the style of football that he wants to play. Because at the minute, we don't have the personnel to be able to do that, in my opinion. And we were fright, quite frankly, atrocious, atrocious after after the minute they scored. That was, I'm not saying heads went down, but there was almost a sense of being resigned to what the score was going to be in terms of the fact that we were not going to win. And it was almost the same old, same old. And uh, you really do come to the question of how many more times can you just keep watching the same Groundhog Day performance? You know, it's absolute dross. We, 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 we've got certain players being targeted continuously. You know, I mean, Big Dan Byrne, um, as much as we like them, and we do, may I add, uh, and he's been he's been awful. You know, he's been quite awful since Christmas. He's been targeted. And I, I, don't, I don't buy into the whole, oh, you've got to have somebody to cover him and all that. Yeah, that's great. Of course, that's the whole purpose of what a winger should be doing as well. It's not like the days of Ginola and Robert when they wouldn't, they wouldn't cross the halfway line, you know. But, uh, but, but surely a, a fullback should be able to sort of be able to deal with more thing, most things. 
don't get me wrong, pace is always a killer. And pace is, if you've got pace, you've got a massive head start. But then surely we should have a fullback. We should have bought a fullback with pace. You know, um, I mean, for, for example, I'll give you an example. D. Edlin in the past was really, really quick. His defending was yeah. atrocious, atrocious defender, but he was lightning quick. And I genuinely think he would have done a better job over the last over the last three months than what we what we witnessed at the moment because you're seeing players just genuinely being targeted for their lack of pace. And that's not his fault. You either have it or you don't. And at that age, you aren't going to get any quicker. Um, Sean Longstaff probably the worst performance I've seen him put in. Uh, he's he's been awful. And I, and and you, you read comments like, "Oh, he's the last been playing with an injury." Then the question is, why? Why yeah. is he playing, why is he playing now? If we've got players who are either back or certainly coming back, don't get us wrong. I'm not asking to throw uh, Elliot Anderson in at the moment full time. You got to give the lad a bit of time um, yeah. to, to make a full full comeback. But you've, you've got other players you could put in. You know, Miley came on and did more in ten minutes than Sean Longstaff did in the whole game. You know, mm -hmm. he supplied a he supplied a goal. He broke up play. Anderson looked really good when he came on as well. I seen him track back about 50 yards when he started off on the left wing and chased the player all the way back to the right back position, whipped the ball off the kid and then did a lovely little pass out of play. I thought, terrific. Uh, you know, and it, and it saddens me even more to see like Geordie lads as well in particular, you know, local lads that you want to see do really well. I, I, I don't get all this, oh, you target all your people, like, oh, you target all the local lads because they're easy. It's not. You want them to do better than anybody else because we've seen great local lads play really well. You know, you've, you've, you've your beards, these, your gas coins, all those exceptional players. But we've also seen very good players, you know, and we've loved it, you know, like Robbie Elliott and all those and Lee Clark. You wouldn't describe them as brilliant, but they were very good players. And, you know, you loved seeing them doing really, really well. Um, and at the moment... Sean, Sean Longstaff's form's awful. Yeah. It, it really is bad. Dan Byrne, for, for me, I'd take both of them out of the team and Botman being the other one. I mean, he's just plummeted off the edge of a cliff. You know? And I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Um, yeah, yeah. Clearly a good footballer. There's no doubt about it, but he's lost all his confidence. And I genuinely think this goes back to the conversation we had a few weeks ago when we are talking about the idea of when you had a cruciate ligament injury, and it can take ages, ages to fully recover. I mean, I've never, I mean, I can only talk about myself on that front, but I, I had a massive injury when I was 18. I did my cruciate and never, ever recovered again. Didn't play football for over 10 years. And even now when I kick a ball like on the very, very rare occasions, it's, um, you're scared. You're genuinely scared. Now, if you're a professional footballer, it's going to take a long time for you to fully feel that everything's back to normal again. And you're going to have that sense of delay and a little bit of worry. And then as, as I quoted again, the last week before, Van Dyke said it took him over a full season to recover. And there's a yeah. world-class centre-half, you know? Um, so I, I, I personally think that's probably the issue. Um, he was never quick, uh, but he was a good passer of the ball and he read the game really, really well. And he's not even doing that now at the moment. So take them out of the picture and put the cells back in. I mean, I, I listen to other podcasts. I listened to one earlier on. They're going, oh, you know, but even still, Botman, even at his worst, is better than Lascelles. No, he's not. No, he's not. I don't see Lascelles making as many mistakes. He's made one mistake from what I recall in the last last three or four months when he's played. And that was the, was it the, was it the cup game? Um, it was the cup game, wasn't it, against Blackburn? Yeah, and that was it, really. It. You know, it was hard to really fault them during that whole period when he came in. And he was actually really unlucky to lose his position. He was mm -hmm. really unlucky because if you go on form, he was banging form. He was scoring a couple of goals, but but he was he was solid on the back there. And what was more impressive, he's actually passing would massively seem to improve, which was quite remarkable. So. Mm -hmm. Change the team. You cannot keep playing the same thing over and over again. And as I say, if you don't learn as a manager and you keep playing the same style and lose in the same manner on a regular, consistent basis, you will lose your job and you cannot complain about it. You know, is house job is house job under threat? Do you a, do you think? Um yes. I do because I, I think if Newcastle if Newcastle end up eleventh at the end of this season, okay, 
let's say, let's assume, uh, then where's the progress? Because two seasons ago, we were 11th. Then last season, we were magnificent. We were fourth, and that was fantastic. It really genuinely was. For me, it was even more exciting last season than under Bobby Robson. It was probably the next best thing I've seen since the Man on My T-shirt. So it was it was really, really enjoyable football. Mm-hmm. But if you... I'll, 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 give, I'll, I'll give you an analogy. If you're a teacher... And you're teaching a student and they don't and they struggle to understand what you're trying to do then you try and teach them in a, di- a different style and if that doesn't work you go to the third one and then you'll go to the fourth one and you'll have different you'll have different methods to try and educate that person mm-hmm. and if that doesn't work then you maybe go and ask seek some help now at the minute we're in a situation where we have one style of football and then look last week it looked like we reverted back to another so we've technically got two and there's no there doesn't seem to be any other plans. There doesn't need to be any other structure or, or ways in terms of changing things. And we seem to be so one dimensional and you can't do that, you know, because every team that we play against is different. And therefore you have to adapt to each style and system that each team we play against. And you've got to be able to think on your feet and change things. Um, if, if we finish seventh, I'll be absolutely thrilled and I'll be sort of eating me words, you know, and I hope I am. You know, I'll, I'll have a big slice of humble pie. Thank you very much. Plenty of gravy on it. But uh, but at the moment, it's 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 really, really bad. I thought some of the decisions were atrocious the other day. I cannot understand taking... taking uh, hello, folks. <laughs> I can't understand taking Bruno off yeah. when we had 15 minutes of play left because... Mm-hmm. We look at the game when we played Everton and we scored twice in the last minute. <laughs> um, yeah. I forgot his name now. The centre half was brilliant. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. You know, and so there's always hope to come back and get two goals in the last 15 minutes. It's happened against us before. So you, you, if it was three, I'd say fair enough. Understand that game's gone, but it wasn't yeah. gone, and it was proven it wasn't gone when Murphy smashed one in with about six minutes to go. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it comes down to tactical. Tactical naivety and the fact that he doesn't seem to be able to change things. I have a plan A, plan, I was saying before there about the teacher thing, plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Have a range of different things and change it. And that doesn't seem to happen. Go three at the back sometimes, maybe, if we're right behind. And just go all out in a time. If we get hit on the break, so be it. We'll, we'll just take it, you know. But there doesn't seem to be any sort of change. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm amazed, and I'm sorry I've gone on a big sort of rant here. I'm no, amazed. No, no. That long staff was on for the whole game, and I hate digging them out because I, I think it's a M, M Dan, they're lovely lads, obviously, really, really nice fellas. But I'm more concerned about my team, and I want my team to win things and do do really well. And as I've said before on the show, I want to see us win one trophy, one trophy before I end up in a pine box. So that's mm-hmm. you know, that's all I want to see is win one trophy, and at the minute. It's not looking. It's not looking great. The football is terrible. I mean, I, I, I was listening earlier on. I didn't realise. Apparently, when Pope went injured, we were second in on form in terms of goals conceded. If you take the form then to now, I believe we're twentieth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've had on eight separate occasions, we've had three goals or more humped past us. That's really worrying. <laughs> you know? um, 14, 14 points in 14 games, I think it was before the Chelsea yeah. game. And you know, a minus goal difference. You know, we haven't we haven't, you know, we've scored goals, but we were conceding them like they're going out of fashion. So that that hasn't helped. But you know, in general, anything, any, 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 any season can look bad when you when you start breaking it down like that. I mean, you could go to a different part of the season and Newcastle look like world beaters, but the yeah. bottom line is we're conceding, we're conceding goals. Do you think it's down? Do you think it's not just down to the fact that the players are, are you know, the vast majority of those players, certainly defensively, are over 30? And yeah, the, Premier uh, League, the Premier League's quick, you know, the Premier League is... is whole, there has to be a whole new sort of broom, if you like, in the summer, in terms yeah. of sweeping out some of the players. The question is, is Eddie Howe the man who's going to do it? And is he the man that the club will trust to give all that money, because I've said before on the show, I think they'll spend at least £250 million. Unfortunately, I I suspect Bruno's will be part of the money that's brought in now as well, because unless we qualify for Europe, why would he really want to stay again? You do have these questions. Um, And therefore, this this summer is possibly the biggest summer since the early mid-90s. 
in terms of what do the boards do. Yeah. Okay, because because Howe has been stupendously good. And it's now, do they think he's gone as far as he, he, he could do? Or do they back him and go for it again? Um, so it, it really is open to debate. I am I am very much sort of on the fence. I, I do think, though, if Newcastle end up 10th or 11th, he has no excuse in terms of, yes, yes, we've had injuries and they've been worse than any other team in the Premier League, but he's not adapted in terms of changing style. I mean, mm. there are so many games where we could have changed the formation or changed the style of play when we thought, right, we're going to make it really hard for you to beat with and we might just take a horrible point, but we'll take a point rather than taking three three goals back past with. And there's been too many occasions where that, for me, has happened, you know, and I'm fed up with watching it. It's really horrible. The owners knew that this was going to be a different season altogether. You know, it was it was mentioned on the Amazon documentary. It won't be a surprise, certainly to uh, you know to to the likes of Dan Ashworth, obviously who's now on gardening lead, but you know to to Peter Silverston, to Darren Eels, to Amanda, Mia, Dad, and Jamie. They all know that this was going to be more difficult because of European football. So I I do believe that Eddie's bought himself a bit of credit. I think if he yeah. finishes eleventh, I think he will start the season as Newcastle manager next year. But I think if he gets off to a bad start. Um, he could find himself out on his ear and new manager in, but like yeah, therefore saying, the question though, Steve. Therefore the question being is, we we I'll go out and buy a number of players approved by Eddie Howe. Do you then get a manager who comes in and doesn't like them? And that's that's the nightmare scenario. So that the club, the club have to stick by him. If that's the case, the club have to stick by him for for me for a whole season. If he if they spend a lot of money, then they they should stick with him. You know, rather than just say, right, we'll give you four games or 10 games or whatever, and it's not working. Um, because what what's the point? Yeah, but this is the problem. And like I say, I keep saying on this platform, we are going to learn more about our owners in this summer than, than we've learned about them so far because they've got decisions to make. Um, you know, Alan, Alan Thompson, I'll come to your other points, but I'll, I'll use this one first. He went, Sid, we've got Miggy, Byrne, Longstaff, Dubravka. We've got Richie, Hayden, Fraser, Dummett in the squad. How's worked a miracle? It takes time, but has he got it? Would any manager change that quickly? And that's that's the point. And Trulls says, credit wins you nothing, though. But what I mean, you know, is he, he's, he's earned the opportunity. Eddie's earned the opportunity. And just because, you know, just because we've had a, a, a worse season this season than we did last year, and, and, and we may not qualify for Europe, and, we, and again, we don't win a trophy. You know, we've had to deal with that for the last 50 plus years. So another season isn't going to make any difference. But we know that if, you know, if, if there's if the if the recruitment's right, then, you know, next season should be better. But, you know, well, we my need argument, to... my, sorry, Mr. Steve, my argument is what would Klopp do? What would Pep Guardiola do? What would a top draw manager do? Would they have yeah. had eight, goal, eight times three goals humped past with? I don't think they would. I think they would have changed the situation, yes. And I, I was talking to my mate, I was an argument with my mate about it, actually, you know, and he's going, oh, but we don't have the same personnel. Of course we don't. Of course we don't. However, I still would have expected a manager or a top draw manager to change the way and the style, of the, the style, and it might have got ugly for a bit. Yeah. Sort of suit the needs and get by, you know, mm -hmm. and I think everybody understands we just need to get to the end of the season now, you know, and hope that we come in the top seven, eight, whatever it may be, and they qualify for Europe. And if they don't, then so so be it. But it's the manner in which it's done. And at the minute, yeah. the manner in which it's done is awful. If you don't keep, if you don't learn from constantly, I keep repeating the same point here, but it's constantly making, making errors. And if that was mm -hmm. in, in a workplace, you'd get sucked. If you keep making the same mistake, you'd get sucked. So you've, yeah. got to, you've got to rectify that mistake and, and resolve it and sort something out and change things. And if we watch him change things and it doesn't work, then so be it. Then it just tells you then he doesn't have the personnel. But yeah. at the minute, we're not finding out any of this. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're not we're not learning anything, you know, and it's it's so frustrating to watch. It really is. It is. It's all about opinions, trolls, and I it respect is. yours as well. So thanks for that. Alan says, uh, Sid, that's the million dollar question. We sacked Bobby Robson with five games gone and we didn't make the Champions League for 20 years. I mean, it was a downward spiral after that, Alan. Uh, there, there, there certainly was. There was a couple it of. Was, I'm going to be dead controversial here. And this is going to be go on, controversial. Go I wouldn't have sacked Kenny Dalglish at the time. 
I probably wouldn't have hired him, but I wouldn't have sacked him at the time because he played four games. He bought a load of players and they sacked him. And you think, well, wow, you've hardly given him a chance. And you remember the players he bought. He bought like Diddy Haman, top player, Shea Given, Nobby Solano, a world class footballer. I think he brought Gary Speed in at some point. He brought, you know, he brought some. Yes, we, we all know he brought Des Hamilton in. And, uh, and everyone's got a bad. Everyone's got a bad. For God's sake. Uh, but he bought, and I think he bought Thomason as well. So he, he generally bought good players, which people seem to forget. Give the give the guy time if that's the case, and that's what I would say with regards to Eddie Howe. If they give him the if they give him the transfer window in the summer, give him a long time to sort of bed him in and get it going. What's the mm. point of four, five, ten games? What's the point? Otherwise, yeah. if you're not confident and you're unsure, well, when in doubt, get him out. It's as simple as that. And get somebody that you're confident with. Yeah, Stephen says, can we trust Eddie not to bring in any signings like Solanke and Villains, etc., which if they same were... Words, exactly they the same be... words I said the other day. You know, mm. that's exactly the same conversation I had with my mate, Simon. You know, I, yeah. I really don't want to see all these Bournemouth guys rocking up. Yeah, I, I mean, look, that's down to recruitment. That's down to Steve Nixon. That's down to the, the scouts who go out. And yes, Eddie Howe will have his say. He might be able to put a few uh, players, you know, in front of uh, in front of these people, but they'll go out and watch. I mean, Nixon was, you know, much publicised at, at the Manchester United Everton game the other day. You know, he could have been watching one of the, you know, one of the players uh, available, you know, for, for transfer in the summer there, you know. Uh, you know. But look, that's down to, that's down to Eddie Howe. And, they, they, you know, they've got, they've got to be somewhere ahead. This boils down, though, unfortunately, Steve, to not having a director of football as well. Because if you have a director of football, it's up to him or her to sort of organise and sort out what the situation is. Do you keep a manager or not? And you would also then have a succession policy already in place. Yeah. You know, because you, 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 we all know the sort of candidates who are going to be available at the minute in the summer. You know, Josie is clearly putting himself out there, isn't he? Neil um, Warnock. Yeah, you've got the guy who looks like Gordon Lee. What's his name again? He's the manager of Bayern Munich. Well, they've got you've got Nagels. Uh, is it Nagelsmann? Nagelsmann, who I like a lot, I have to say. Flick. What's the manager? What's his name? You've got you've got Flick as well, who's another one who's been named. And yeah. Herr Flick, I hear in the ad. Uh, you've got Tuchel will be available. That's the one. Jürgen. If on your look, I like show. He's the spin yeah. image, Gordon Lee. Jurgen um, Jurgen Jurgen Klopp could be yeah, Jurgen Klopp's going to be available. He may well be coming to Newcastle. Um, uh, Conte Conte is available. Rafa Benitez he's doing nothing at the moment. I think Pochettino will probably be ironically available as well in the summer. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that's what's so frustrating. That was the worst Chelsea team going back to football for a second. That was the worst football team Chelsea team we've played in thirty years, probably since ninety four, and we still got beat off them. Yeah, you know, that's, that's the what, disappointment. That's what's so frustrating. That's what's so frustrating here, Flick. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Arteta has had five years and won one FA Cup with a much better squad to start with. Look at Arsenal now, says Alan. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it, it's it's going to take us a while to catch up with those. I want to just get through a couple of these other points that were made. Jolly boy. Hi, Steve. I'm starting to think that maybe we are just a mid-table quality team uh, and are in our rightful place. Bruno and Isaac are the only two that get a look in in the top four clubs right now. Am I wrong? You're not wrong. I mean, Isaac and Bruno are players who would probably look at players in Liverpool, Arsenal, you know, um, you know, Tottenham at the moment, who are who are above us, certainly would look at players at, at a club like that. But we have to start somewhere. Um, Kieran Trippier, another one who, yes, coming towards the end of his career, but still capable of slotting into any team in the Premier League and doing. I, I, doing I would add Livermento. Actually, I thought he was fantastic the other night. The night. Well, he was a bright spark, wasn't he? The other night, he was a bright spark in a, in an otherwise disappointing result. Um, you know, it was. He was, it was, it was, it was for me the best player on the park. You know, I know the, the rave on about Cole, who had a good game, obviously, and scored. But I thought Livermento was the best player on the park. I thought he was fabulous to watch. Mid-table quality team. Look, you are what you are where you are at the end of the season. That's how good yeah. you are. If we finish yeah. 10th, then that's how good we are yeah. this season. You know, it's as simple as that. Um, I think a lot of people drag up the history as well. They look back at you know Bournemouth and, and what how did it Bournemouth and he conceded goals, and this is what happened, and that's the reason he got sacked, and that's what he's gonna do here at Newcastle now. But you know, this is Newcastle United, it's 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 Bournemouth uh, are yeah, a different. Can I, just, can I just add to that though, Mike? Because and I, I have to say I really dislike Jamie Carragher, but uh, J Jamie Carragher sort of brought it up, and I think he does it deliberately to try and stir up some sort of thought with regards to it because he clearly he only cares about two teams. That's Liverpool and Everton because he was an Evertonian, wasn't he, as a kid? Um, yeah. 
and he, he still says they're the team who'd always support over Liverpool, actually, but uh, from what I recall. But um, he was hopping on about the fact that this will be Howe's sixth year out of seven where his team concedes 60 goals or more in a season, which is, you know, you have to sort of accept that. <laughs> there's no there's no getting away from the stats. You know, it's not, it's not a great look. And we thought he'd resolved it last year because he'd went away and he learned. And I thought, wow, he's gone away. He's learned under the best in terms of boring, boring Simeone's boring, bloody, but really good defensive football. You know, and I thought, wow, he's gone away and done a job there, but resorted back to sort of a different style of football, which we don't have. We just don't have the personnel to be able to play it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, totally. Uh, well, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's why it's them. Yeah, because we should have beaten Chelsea, Alan. We, we know that. Yeah, Darren Lee says, uh, the season's slipping away unless we can pull off a shock and beat City this weekend to reach the last four of the Cup. It would be typical of Newcastle Sid to do that, of course, you know, but I mean, I think we're all, even the most optimistic fan would say that that's going to be too much of a job, but never say never. If Newcastle can get them to a penalty shootout, anything's possible. True, but I ain't going to be putting, <laughs> I ain't going to be putting a bet on it. <laughs> <laughs> And Darren also mentioned Botman. He doesn't look the same player as last season. Is he still carrying an injury? I think I think a lot can be said about that. I, I just wonder, maybe not injuries and carrying injuries, but maybe it's something to do with getting getting that fitness that Howe insists on having. And, and when a player's coming back in, expected to pick up the ground running from where from where he's been, which is on the sidelines for a vast amount of time, like Botman was, like Barnes was, like Willock's been. Um Maybe these players are struggling to get back up to those fitness levels that Howe expects. It's true. And you also have some players who take longer than others to get back up and adapt. I mean, I remember watching Rob Lee. And when Rob Lee was injured, it used to take him five or six games to get fully back into the groove. Mm -hmm. he was, you just knew it would take him a bit of time. He was just one of them blokes. Great player, obviously. But it would take him, it would take him five or six games before he was sort of fully back in the sort of groove and maybe he's, he, he's one of them, but as I say, I go back to my point of the the the, the cruciate the cru sorry, sorry, the cruciate ligament thing there. Yeah. Um, and psychologically, physically, that might take a long, long time. I, I genuinely don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's hope it's not the same for Anthony Gordon, who uh, went off. Uh, and that was that was that was a wince a wincing moment, wasn't it? I mean, we've had all kinds of theories. People saying, "Yeah, that's what you do when you get a bad injury like that. You you rotate the the limb as long as you don't put it side to side. You know, you know, pushing it up and down isn't a major issue." But it it didn't look good, did it? And then that photograph, which is now photographs can can tell a multitude of lies as well as a multitude of truths. But looking at looking down at his knee and and and, and Eddie looking at it, I mean. You know, the scan will tell us the true story, but it didn't look good, did it? It was it was like proper old school. I, I recall when I had done mine, and, I, and it was, I went to see this old physio before I got the operation, and I literally remember him going, "How was that, son?" <laughs> On your name, I went, "Wow!" <laughs> it was like it was like yeah. literally. It was like wow. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. It was it it was it was concerning that it really was concerning to to see that. So, uh, Alan, uh, we'll get your other points in uh, before we go to the ads. Stephen said, in our history, uh, seven years from nineteen fifty, your average wins in a season is four. Uh, four away, we have three with five to go. We have consistently been bad away from home. Eight last season has only been done three times in seventy three years. Good stats, Alan. Good, good stats. Um, and Alan also said, do you seriously think we were going to be uh, win at Chelsea? Steve said it was going to be 5-0. That was my reverse psychology, you remember, Alan. <laughs> I thought we'd get beat 3-0. It was 3-2, which isn't so bad. So, yeah, I, did, uh, yeah. I, did think, I did think we'd win. I, I did think we'd win. I thought we, Ian Wright made the point really, really well, actually. He spoke yeah. with a lot of sense, actually. And he said he thought we would we'd sit back and as I, as I said earlier on, play them on the counter. He said, we looked really good. And he was right. We looked really good against Wolves, resorting back to plan A, if you like, yeah. the original plan A, rather than the plan B front foot football. And uh, we didn't. We resorted back to what we'd been doing all season. And we looked terrible. There were massive gaps again in the middle of the park, you know, and it was just the same old, same old. It was rubbish. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, Jason, good afternoon. Eddie Howe would rather play his favourites carrying injuries rather than play fully fit non-regulars. And uh, Stephen says, Gordon's missus will be the only one happy. She'll get us some holiday now. I'm sure that's not the main focus uh, of uh, Anthony Gordon. I'm sure he was, hope he was hoping he was going to be away on, uh, on, on European duty. Well, the ironic thing, of course, he was in the he was on one of the papers. He was in some forum where he, when he says, oh, he goes, on the plus side, the, the physio never gets to see me. And of yeah, course, talk next, about year, next game he's in. Should never say anything like that, should you? You jinxed it. Okay, we're halfway through the show. Uh, time for a quick break. Here's the ads. A big thanks to all our sponsors, Skips and Bins. Go to their website, skipsandbins.com. Email inquiries at skipsandbins.com or telephone 0800 25 45 25 3. Easy contract free and pay as you go. Waste collection. Thanks to Mr. Vicky Sources, handmade in Cumbria. Go to their website, mrvickies.co.uk, email info at mrvickies.co.uk or telephone 01768 210102. Thanks to United Group Travel. Go to their website, unitedgrouptravel.com, email info at unitedgrouptravel.com or phone 01670 632 460 or mobile 0791 666 they're a local company from Morpeth, and there are no strangers on our tours, just friends you haven't met yet. Big thanks to Media Arts for all the help with the video side of things. And if you want to subscribe to the channel, hit the subscribe button under the video. Click the thumb up to like the video and click share to share to your social media. If you want to help the channel financially, you can pay a one-off £25 fee. You get a cup, a scarf, a pen and a membership card and entry into the NUFC Matters monthly draw. Email john at nufcmatters.com for more details. Or if you've got a smartphone, scan the QR code now and it takes you straight to the membership pack. We also support the food bank on this channel. Go to nufcfansfoodbank.co.uk and you'll find the match day bucket. You can make a donation virtually today. You can also find us on iTunes, Spotify and other podcast providers. We also do events during the year, NUFC Matters Live. We'll be at the O2 City Hall on Friday the 2nd of August for an evening with Rob Lee, one night in Antwerp. Tickets start at £15 and you can get them from ticketmaster.co.uk. An evening with the entertainers takes place on Friday the 24th of January 2025 at the Tyne Theatre and Opera House in Newcastle. Telephone 0844 249 1000 or visit the website tynetheatreandoperahouse.uk to buy tickets today. You can also catch me on the Northeast Footy Breakfast Show live on Toon Radio weekdays 7 till 9 a.m. on DAB, Smart Speakers, and the tuneuk.com. <laughs> And as always on Talk of the Tune, it's time to welcome Rob. How are you, Rob, from Give Up the Ghost? Hiya, Steve. Hiya, said I'm okay. Hello, Rob. Good, right. Right. Good to see you, mate. Good to see you. And uh, Rob, as you are all aware now, gives us a, an album review. So, Rob, uh, I, I notice you've sent us another one, which you're not doing, uh, which seems to be coming a bit of a thing. Uh, super long, high-pitched farts. Yeah, some classics on that really is. <laughs> yeah, some, rip, some some rippers I can imagine. Yeah, I, I'm ripping one of those. Says uh, without the uh, without the swear word, but uh, very good. Yes, Rob, I'm sure you'll have another one of them next week. But uh, yes. all, on a serious note, what album are you reviewing today? Today I'm doing an album that I really liked at the time. It was like a guilty pleasure to me. A band um, KLF, which is Copyright Liberation Front, um, also known as the Justified Ancients of Mumu, the Jammed. And the Time Lords, they were basically, I never knew this was, a, they had four albums out, and this was the last album. I thought there was one album. Now, this is an album, if, I don't know if Sid has any contacts, or whatever, but I cannot find it on vinyl. 
because after the last gig, they deleted everything. The last words they said was, <laughs> Ailey, have now left the music business. But it's extremely rare to find. So I've got a few of the 12 inches. Brilliant album. I've been listening to this a lot recently. Um, this is Bill Drummond, um, Scottish guy. I think he's from, up from Aberdeen way, not far from myself. And um, Jimmy Cotty. There was also a book released called The Manual. It was called How to Have a Number One the Easy Way. That's again extremely rare it's going to be approximately 200 pound and it's just the whole thing with this album was uh taking the mickey and how easy it was to have an album and, and a hit album just totally taking the mickey it was a bit like um malcolm mclaren in reverse so yeah it's, it's a strange one this because there's more sort of story based about the band and the song so i'll open up anyway it's um what time is love it's, classic song it's really sort of soft atmospheric opener and it sort of kicks in with like machine guns strong hip-hop rave tune absolutely a belter and there's a lots of samples too much to talk about and it's from the beatles to sam fox there's there's so much then track two is make it rain it's 808 state s express a damsky it was sung by maxine harvey again another pound and dance song Stands the test of time, it really does. If this, any of these songs or any of these albums released now, I think the rave scene's sort of coming back. Um, Sharon's daughter um, goes to rave, so it's it's strange. So sort of looking looking at the youngsters now going out doing the same thing. Then talking of rave culture, three AM Eternal, which again up in Scotland had resurrection. There was there was lots of um, raves happening at the time, legal and illegal ones. So this is open so this is radio freedom it's a song about rave culture hence a 3 a.m eternal top draw acid house song love it brilliant song and you've got church of the klf again this is sung by maxine harvey i love the words to this love and pain war and peace but to me it's the pity the world doesn't listen to this track and then um, listen to it you know um really good trancy song you've got last train to trans central this is jimmy cotty's flat he used to call it trans central just the name for you, I had three student flat at the time. It's an epic theatrical club tune. House techno rap vocals by somebody called Richard the Force. You've got Build a Fire. Love this song. It's atmospheric again. It's it's spoken word by Will Drummond. It's just nice how he just sort of narrates at the back of this and he's spoken part word on this one. I can hear Twin Peaks theme tune going throughout this whole song. I really like it. Not a weak song so far. Track seven, The White Room. Again, this fits perfectly in the album. Great beat. It's a scat rapping. I remember Scat Man John. I'm not going to um, try and sing it, but Steve, maybe you can one day. Um, <laughs> so, 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 if you remember it, Scat Man John, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's quite an emotional song. It's really sublime. It's just, I love it. I mean, I've been doing some odd jobs and arts and crafts and stuff, and this is what I've been listening to for weeks now. Um, track eight, No More Tears, again, it's quite an unusual track, very ambient, really good lyrics. Sunlight, sunlight in a winter's day, the Moo Moo is here to stay. Then, of course, you've got Justified and Ancient. It was originally um, supposed to be Dolly Parton, but they made the wrong call to um, Texas and it's Tammy Wynette. So when Tammy Wynette turned up to do the vocals, I think one of them said to the other one, it's just, it's just, it just isn't who we wanted, but it turned out fine. Again, this is um, all bound for Moomoo Land. It's Moomoo, I used to always wonder what it was, but it seems like it's a reference from the Illuminatus. It's a science fiction book series from the 1970s. I'm not aware of it, but the secret world order of the Illuminati spreading chaos and misinformation. That's what the band are about. And again, the final show they ever done, it was, I think it was a Brit Awards, I'm not too sure. It was like a death metal band done 3 a.m. eternal. Um, Bill Drummond came on my machine gun, firing blanks everywhere. Done this, it was just chaos. And at the end of it, KLF have now left the music business. They got an award for that. They never picked it up. Someone on their behalf did. They took it up to Stonehenge, buried it. They wanted nothing to do with the music business because they'd done what they wanted to. How easy is this to, you know, chart success? Then a farmer went up, I think it was about 10 years after that, found it, gave it back to them. What did they do? They went back up, dug a bigger hole. So it's still up there. And yes, they were the band that 
set fire to a million pounds and it, it was real and now it's illegal to deface money but it's it's fine to burn it because who's going to be you know in the right frame of mind to burn all the money but that's that is true and it was a place called the isle of jura where they burnt it and um it's just unbelievable it's just the stories the story behind the whole band that it was just the time lords you know doctor and tardis and it was just an absolute p take of everything and it, 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 they thought it was that bad they didn't want to put the name to it hence the name the time lords they thought people will just buy this rubbish and they did but they were one of the biggest selling singles bands in the 90s and it was just mm. a laugh just a laugh so experimental but there's some beautiful tracks on this album it's, to me it's a a nine and a half out of ten just because there's not um many musicians on it it's just a lot of sampling and that but again utah saints a band i really like done the same but um hats off them absolutely brilliant album yeah i mean it, it is a good album it's one of those mm. that to be honest it's you know it stands out especially if you're involved in the rave culture back in the day mm. um i used to go at the resurrections up in up in scotland back in the day mm. and it was um it, it is great there's a great documentary as well which uh, was mm. done about this which i think it was on sky documentaries last year or the year before and it was they, they actually documented built the burning of the money um incredible incredible people mm -hmm. very intelligent uh stemmed mm -hmm. from from artwork etc um yeah. you know there were artists i think back in the day but yeah i mean i haven't read the manual it's something i would like to read uh, mm -hmm. i've got to be honest but it, it's uh it's fascinating it's, it, it's a fascinating uh, fascinating story if nothing else yeah, and, that's, uh, that's it yeah yeah what's your thoughts on that sid yeah, good album, actually. Uh, some really good songs on it. I really like the time mm -hmm. you made that one. Uh, Doctor mm -hmm. and the Tardis, of course, was Gary Glitter's Rock and Roll Part 2, wasn't it? <laughs> I, I didn't want to say um, that person's yeah. name. That's over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they want to they try to airbrush that from history as well, I really? think, as well. But um, it was number one as well, if I recall rightly. I'm pretty sure it correct. did. It yeah. did. It did. So, uh, Sid, as always, you usually bring us something to the, uh, the yeah, table very briefly. as well. Yeah. What have you got us? Um, all my I've got Iggy Pop's Lust for Life, which is an absolute masterpiece. I went to see um, Lust for Life perform the other day. It had Clem Burke on drums. It had uh, Katie Puckrick on vocals, and she was actually excellent. It had uh, Kevin Armstrong, Bowie's old guitarist, for a short while on guitar. And it had Glenn Matlock on bass. It was a fantastic gig at the, at the exchange in uh, North Shields. What a top, top show that was. It was mm. They just did loads of great Iggy stuff. They did the whole of this. They did a good chunk of The Idiot and then loads of his other song, singles and Stooges stuff. It was magic. And a few Bowie songs. So it was, it was a top draw gig. Uh, the album came out in 77. It was his second album of the year. He did three albums, bizarrely, or released three albums that year. Um it's 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 a bit more rock based than the idiot. I have to say I love the idiot. The idiot is one of my favourite ever albums. But this is a bit more rock based. Um, but we have slightly less to do with it, although he still features on about seven of the tracks. Uh, he actually co-wrote uh, the song "Lust for Life." He basically picked up a picked up a banjo and came up with the rhythm, and then Iggy just sort of just did the lyrics over the top of it. Some really great songs on it, on it with regards to about well, quitting heroin, hence the fact it featured in Train Spotting. Um, so you've got other songs on there that, that, that fit in with that theme. You've got Some Weird Sin. You've got the other big song, The Passenger, which was a great, great song. Uh, you've got uh, Sweet Sixteen's a great song, really good guitar right. tune. It's just a top, top-notch album, and it's got a number of tracks that, that featured on one of Bowie's worst albums tonight, uh, such as Neighbourhood Threat. Iggy's version's miles better. Um, I say some we had seen tonight's on there as well. So there's some songs that Iggy does so much better. It's just a great, great album that should have been much, much bigger. Really, really good. But I mean, it was it, this was his biggest album till 2015. Bizarrely, I was quite taken aback when I read that. None of his albums have been big albums, which for me is scandalous because I just think he's a genius. So yeah, Iggy. Iggy Pop, Lust for Life, go, go and just check it out. And I am doing a show on my shows. I'm doing Essential Albums, and this is one that's going to be on Friday. It'll be about 10 minutes from a review in a bit more detail. Okay, and Harry. you picked out a book as well, which yeah, is, I've, yeah, I've read this one. Good lad, Harry. I thought, well, we're doing a football show. I should do something football-based. Uh, Harry Pearson's The Four Corners, just genuinely really, really funny. Uh, it covers all parts of the game, from St. James's Park to Langley Park. It's got written here, from Rogue to Willington, The Four Corners, Harry Pearson's brilliant account of Northeast football in 93 to 94. There's, I love this, this quote in it when the guy goes, Kevin Keegan, what the bloody hell's he going to do? It's in Durham at some point. It was just great. 
And then the blurb, I've got to read this because it's funny. Uh, the blurb on the fourth corner says, it's a book in which Wilf Mannion rubs shoulders with Sunland Skinhead and recollections of Len, Sha uh, Len Shackleton's blight, blights the lives of village shop uh, shoppers and the appointment of Kevin Keegan as manager of Newcastle, celebrated by a man in a leather Stetson crooning for the good times to the accompaniment of a midi organ. Uh, the fourth corner is a tale of heroism and human frailty, passion and the perils of eating an egg man is, egg man is stotty without staining your trousers, <laughs> which is just class. It's genuinely one of those books where you roar out loud. It's really, really funny. And he's got a follow-up as well. I think it's called The Father Corner, uh, which he just released a couple of years ago. And he's a really nice guy, Harry Pierce, and uh, down from Borough Way. So check check both of them out. They're really funny, genuinely funny books about Northeast football at all levels. Brilliant. Good stuff. Uh, Rob, just before you go, quick prediction for the uh, the game of the weekend in the FA Cup against Manchester City. Two words. No comment. <laughs> uh, um, and on that, on that note, Rob, I think that's probably best to leave it at that. I don't think any of us will get the prediction right for this week. Um, but uh, yeah, just, I can um, see why you said that. Just want to say a big shout out to Sharon. If she's watching, she's down at her mother's just now. She just came out of hospital this morning. So shout out to Sharon. Get well soon, Sean. I'll see you soon. Um, yeah, big shout out to Sharon from us as well. And Mark Byer says, Iggy Pop, how fitting to give him on the show, considering it's Sean Longstaff's new nickname, The Passenger. Uh, oh, God. Rob, see you next week, mate. Take care. Okay. Take Cheers, care, guys. man. Bye bye. Bye bye. Great to have Rob on as always. Uh, he'll be back next week. And um, yeah, last comment I, I didn't get a chance to go to. I reckon we'll still make European position. My doubts are will any big name players come from overseas to play for Eddie Howe? This season, injuries aside, has stunted the growth of his stock. Um, Europe, then. If we win against West Ham in two weeks' time, Sid, things look a bit different again. You know, it's all back on and we're all way. <laughs> Such as the life as a football fan. That's but, where we're at, isn't it? That's the problem. Uh, at the moment, we're very fickle. Somebody, I, I, I mean, when I was out and about today, a Newcastle fan said to me, we're the most fickle football fans ever. Well, it's not fans. true. It's not true because the Chelsea fans are desperate for their manager to go. I tell you, um, we're the most fickle on social media. That's the way it no. feels, anyway. On, on yeah, it. I, I, again, I don't think it is. It's just because we're not on sites of other other clubs. You know, possibly, other clubs, yeah, possibly. You know, West Ham fans, I'm sure, will be the same. And I mean, they're all wanting Moyes out. I probably understand why at a point. But you know, you've got you've got all that going on. It's it's. I don't think we are. I think it's because we live in a little bubble. And on social media, we tend to follow, not always, because I, I, I tend to follow more music based. So I'll, I'll often see like Arsenal fans on or Liverpool fans or whoever will comment and I have to bite my tongue and, <laughs> and not comment. Uh, but it's, yeah, I, I think it's pretty much the same everywhere else in most cases, but not all, not all. Can I just make a point there about European football though, about Eddie Howe? If you look at it, I'd say Isaac and... Um, Bruno came to Newcastle under a time when they didn't clearly wouldn't have known who he was. Um, so I don't think that's always the case. And also, you may get a manager, just assume we've got Jose Mourinho. That would probably stop a number of players from coming to mm. the club. Mm -hmm. In terms of the fact that his, his reputation now is tarnished with a number of players. You know, I mean, it might attract players because his track record is exceptional, but it might therefore... Deter, deter players from coming as well due to the fact that he's got quite a bad reputation with some players. So it's, it swings and roundabouts. It really is. There are some managers who've got great reputations and then they, they clearly will attract players like the, the German national manager at the moment. But then there are others who, who less so, I think would be the case. Finishing seventh now will be a bonus for the club, yeah. says Darren. And, um, I agree I, with I, Darren. Yeah, I agree as well. Yeah, I think so. There's no word on Anthony Gordon, uh, Darren, and uh, a new name in the chat. Don't say we don't do things for you, mate. Bob, randomly. There you go. <laughs> Gordon, and, and they say Gordon's out for the rest of the season. I mean, nobody knows that yet, but uh, it didn't look good at the weekend. We, we, we've got to hope that, you know, that there is a, there is always hope. You know, but it, it didn't look good uh, whatsoever. From, from our perspective, we go into the FA Cup game this weekend and I, you know, it's, it, we're almost crestfallen. We've almost accepted, haven't we, where we're at as far as uh, as far as this is concerned. I think we all think we're, we're going out. 
But yep. it would be typical of Newcastle, Sid. It would be typical of Newcastle to to win that game um, at the weekend and go through. And you know, it, it, would, it would be because I look at the Manchester United game and I wasn't, I was unsure. I was unsure. But uh, yeah, it's Man City. I, I look at their manager. They've got the best manager in the world. <laughs> um, they, it's I, I don't expect a thing. I, I genuinely don't expect a thing. And the, and. You know, let's be honest, the, the, the BBC and various other things are wetting themselves for a, for a Man City-Liverpool final. They really have. I mean, the fact that they've done the whole draw now and they can't face each other, which just stinks in itself. Um, it, it's clearly set up for a, for a, a Liverpool-Man City final and that's what they want. And uh, I, I unfortunately don't think we're going to go there and spoil the party. I don't see it happening. I really don't. I'd be amazed, let's put it that way, amazed. Nothing will give me greater pleasure, as you know, and I keep saying. The ultimate dream for me would be to see us beat Liverpool in an FA Cup final. It would be, oh my God, it would be so circular to have gone 50 years and get to the 2024 final from my first game of watching the Liverpool game in 74. To see us win would be the, the ultimate dream, but I unfortunately don't see it happening. I really don't. I mean, it's a 5.30 kick-off. Uh, 7,800 Newcastle fans going to be there. That's going to make a difference, Sid, though. You know, the, the, the support does make a difference. It, it, it does to a point. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's down to who's on the pitch. Yeah, you know, it is. Nobody... Pitch, look at their players. And I'm not going there with the defeatist attitude over where we're already beaten. That's not that's not what I'm trying to say at all. I'm just trying to be realistic and yeah. look at some of their players and they are top top notch players. And then I look at some of ours who I've already mentioned and I'm not going to repeat them. Yeah. No you Grealish, know. no Grealish, no Edison for them. So there's two two you know players who you know could could have made a, a difference not playing. Simon Hooper as the referee, second game in charge uh, for the Wiltshire Whistler, uh, following the four one Premier League home over Chelsea and uh, VAR, which is an operation because it's a Premier League ground is Thomas Brammel. So uh, we'll cover that uh, a little bit later in the week. There was a big tweet that went viral, uh, Sid, I'm sure you saw it, of Newcastle fans celebrating and applauding the players after the match. Um, ultimately, that became a huge talking issue because the, the guy who tweeted it said he was absolutely annoyed, furious um, at our fans for celebrating the fact that we just lost to Chelsea 3-2. Um, Newcastle fans travel in numbers, you know, week in, week out. And, you know, they, they pay the money, they take the chance and they take that, you know, you, you know, they, they do what they want to do. Um, I, I, I went on the, the breakfast show this morning and I said, that is how, you know, there's, there's 500 or so hardcore fans who probably go to every single game. Um, and they, no matter what, win, lose or draw, will show appreciation for the team. I didn't see anything wrong with what they were doing. Um, unfortunately, now at various grounds, there's there's a habit of playing songs such as you know "Free from Desire," which which gets people jumping up and down. Newcastle fans have now got songs for players, something we didn't have under the Ashley era because the players either weren't here long enough or the players were absolutely garbage. Whereas a lot of these songs that 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 are played now tie in with the names of some of our players or the songs for our players. So it's it's natural that. Certainly the younger element in our fan base are jumping up and down, singing the songs and, you know, clapping the players regardless. But I didn't see anything wrong with it, Sid. It's up to them. It's What I've done it, no. Um, you know, I, I appreciate losing, was it 5-0 at Man U and getting relegated, whatever it was, in 1989. Fair enough. I can see why you do it then as a sense of ironic sort of, uh, ironic sort of cheer. Um but our age group, we used to celebrate getting a corner at Old Trafford. You know, <laughs> we, or, we used, or we used to be at Anfield singing, all we are saying is give us a go. Yeah. You know, so we've always we've always cheered in the face of adversity because that's where we've always been. It is. Uh, but the argument, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, is that it's a loser's mentality, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore should should the fan base not be a little bit more miffed uh, and therefore, I'm not saying sort of effing and blinding at the players or anything like that, you know, but give them a round of applause and that's basically it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's probably what I would have done if I'm being brutally honest. But then again, I'm a, I'm a man in his, in his 50s. I ain't some sort of young kid who's like 21 or something, you know, which I totally get. And that's up to them. I'm not yeah, I'm not yet to castigate a young kid. Let them do what they want. That's entirely up to them. 
So that's fine. That, that's absolutely fine by me. <laughs> you know, if they want to you go and enjoy yourself, you only only young once is the phrase, you know. So go yeah, and have yeah. a good time. So just don't yeah. just don't just don't spill your beer on me. I think that's what most people say. Or chuck your beer in our direction when you're jumping up and down. I don't get can I just put on, I don't understand people going to concerts throwing pints of beer. No. You know, I don't get it. I I, really, I do not understand it. I just think it's nuts. I think that's just what what you're doing. What you're doing. Can you sell a shake, man. You know. Yeah. <laughs> we, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have minded when we were 17 and 18, mate. It would have just been <laughs> water off a duck's back. Would have been too drunk to notice. That's just uh, just just getting getting older. That's what happens. Uh, don't forget, you can get yourself uh, to the NUFC Matters Live End of Season Party, 20th of July. Tickets are a tenner from nufcmatters.com and newcastlelegends.com. Uh, there is an acoustic set with Trev and Gaz from the Long Sands, Supermat and Gibbo are there, a uh, whole host of people from NUFC Matters, and the proceeds are going to Dementia Matters, so get yourselves along to that. And the tickets for Beardsley are on sale as well. 2nd of June at the Irish Centre. Tickets now available on Woucher. What's coming up on Songs from the Attic 1977 then, Sid? I'm doing the, doing the Iggy Pop one, which I've done. I just need to upload it. I'm doing a few little really shorts, and then we're doing Talking Heads. We've got quite a few do, coming on Talking Heads, The Who, Ramones, Boy. So Good stuff. Any, anybody anybody who follows NUFC Matters, get yourselves across to Songs from the Attic 1977 and subscribe on YouTube. And we will be back next week, Sid. Look forward to it, mate. Yes, prediction, yes. prediction by Man City. Difficult, mate. It's difficult. I think we'll get before one. Oof. I'm going to go for. A new, I'm going to. I'm, I usually keep my prediction for a Thursday night. I am going for Newcastle to progress on penalties. Oh, oh, oh I tell you what, that'd be great, wouldn't it? It would be yeah. <laughs> live on telly in front of the nation. Uh, it get in a way it gets us out of making a prediction. I'm just going to say we're going to win on penalties. <laughs> That, there is, a, there is, a, there's another bit of logic there. But uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks to the moderators. We will be back six o'clock tomorrow night with Super Mac and Gibbo. But for now, thanks for tuning in. Take care, Sid. See you later. Take care, folks. Bye bye.